I want to say some more about complex differentiability, tie it in with some other standard material that you'd see at the start of a uh, complex variables class. Um, remember the calculation we did, what I feel like is the, the central calculation of all these videos, uh, where we looked at the microscope and we just did a, uh, a little rectangle it ended up, when we looked at the circulation per unit area, or the sort of the closed curve line integral for the unit area, very, very closely related to the circulation of a vector field, as I was pointing out, we got the difference between the basically the definition of the derivative applied in two different directions, the real direction and the pure imaginary direction. And that was supposed to be zero if the thing really was complex differentiable. Okay. Um, and I just want to reinterpret this in terms of partial derivatives. Okay. If f of um, z is u plus iv, and these are real functions, and I break out the real and imaginary parts of z. So here I'm starting to kind of forget for a minute that I'm in the complex plane and just thinking of it as some version of R2 where I happen to call one direction real and the other imaginary. I'm purposely forgetting the wonderful complex algebra, the idea that this is really a one-dimensional uh, complex line. It's really, but it's a real plane, okay? Then what does this all equal, okay? This thing is going to be the derivative of that whole thing. I haven't broken that up quite yet with respect to the partial derivative with respect to x because that's just changing um, x and not i, y. And then minus, um, now we've got to be a little careful about this, okay? Um, it's a minus, and then I've got an i on the bottom here. When I do partial derivatives, I don't know about things like multiplying, dividing by i. So I've got to just factor that out. Well, a minus 1 over i turns into a plus i. And then with that taken out, this is exactly just how u plus iv, f, varies when I vary in the vertical direction. Now the i is just telling me go up and down. That's just d by dy. Okay. And that's supposed to be 0. Okay. So that's if it's if f prime of z exists in the complex world. Okay. So this is one way to say that. And now I'm going to break it up into the u's and v's separately and really try to to try to go to this other perspective with uh, where it's just a function from R2 to R2 and forget too much about the complex algebra. I can't resist, uh, I'm not going to say much about it, but when this isn't zero, this actually does have a name and it's really quite useful to go beyond um, only only functions where this exists. For example, like z bar, remember, that's a really useful thing to be able to talk about um, in complex uh, variables and z bar, the derivative, doesn't exist. Okay, This is actually called df by dz bar. You can actually um, define the derivative with respect to z and z bar, and they work a lot like ordinary partial derivatives do. There's some subtleties to that, um, but I just thought I'd mention it. That goes a little bit beyond what you usually see in a first year complex variables class. This does have a name, even when it's not zero, and it's called d by dz bar. Okay, so let me just expand this out though. Let's, in the case where it's zero, let me go ahead and move up to here. Okay, um, so I'm just going to look at real imaginary parts, so I can always do that. So du dx, and then notice these i's are going to produce a minus, minus dv dy. And that's going to be the, the real part of all this guy. And then I look at the imaginary part, well that's going to be a dv dx. And then a plus a du dy. Okay, now that's supposed to be zero as a complex number, and so there, therefore it really gives us two equations, du dx minus dv dy is zero, or I can move it over. So du dx equals dv dy, and dv dx, because the sum of these guys should be zero, 
dv dx is minus du dy. These are very, very famous equations called the cauchy riemann equations, going back to two of the fathers of modern complex analysis. And so you could, if you want, and there's, there's some usefulness to this, it's a good perspective in some ways, um, you could think of the study of complex, one-dimensional complex analysis, ordinary complex variables, as simply functions from the plane to the plane that happen to satisfy this funky con condition on partial derivatives. That's not incredibly well motivated, um, but it's definitely an important perspective because there are, um, this is a system of partial differential equations with lots of good properties. It's, for example, it's called an elliptic system, although I won't go into that. Um, and uh, if you know a lot about PDEs, then that tells you a lot about what's going on here. Okay, so it's definitely a very important part of the, of the puzzle, even though it's not where we started. I want to say something about the geometry of it, because that is really quite interesting. Um, it doesn't take a lot of, of uh, knowledge to figure out. Remember, when we have a function from R2 to R2, we can look at the matrix of derivatives of that function. This is, um, I started out talking about, let's look at the picture of this as a map from R2 to R2. Okay, so I've got some point and I look at, if I move a little bit to this way, where it's, let's say that point gets sent over here. So this is like Z and this is F of Z. If I move a little bit in the, in the horizontal, in other words, the real direction, well, what vector does that get sent to? And if I move a little bit in the I direction, well, what vector does that get sent to? Okay, um, then the geometry of that map is encoded in the matrix of the derivatives. Okay, and the matrix of derivatives is always given by du dx du dy dv dx dv dy. So here it helps if you've seen this level of multivariable calculus to think a little bit about the intuition of the matrix, matrix of derivatives. If you know that the, a matrix encodes a linear transformation and that has geometric properties. Um, so I'll assume you know a little bit about that. Well, what is it in, in this case? This reduces it down to four possible, four independent things that can vary to just two. Um, it's really of the form like something, I'll call this A, but then that has to be the same thing. So the diagonals are equal. And then the off diagonals are opposite to each other, okay? Where this is just a nice shorthand for du dx and b is just a shorthand for dv dx. Okay, well, that might look a little familiar. If you've done examples of two by two uh, matrices as linear transformations, um, one example that you almost certainly would have seen of this form is cosine theta minus sine theta sine theta cosine theta. That is a rotation by angle theta. It's a very special kind of linear transformation. Um, it's somewhat like I, I did here. It cannot do something like this. It can't take two like perpendicular vectors and turn them into something that's not perpendicular. Okay. It can't change this angle. It's just a pure rotation, a very special linear transformation. Now, that's not quite what this has to be because A and B don't have to actually be cosine and sine. What's special about cosine and sine is if a squared plus b squared also happens to equal 1. And there's nothing in these equations that say that. But I can get a general matrix of this form by just multiplying that all by some constant. I'll call it r, because that certainly is something that loves to go in front of cosine theta and sine theta. Okay, And so what does that do? It's just a scaling. So what this says is the matrix of derivatives, the local version of a map that satisfies complex differentiability, can only do what I've shown here, which is I rotated, but I left the angle between the vectors orthogonal, and I scaled, but I scaled equally in the vectors. Okay, This just multiplies everything by the same number. So that's very cool. That's a, a super important um, geometric property of complex differentiable functions. And somebody already mentioned this word in a comment uh, in a previous part. Uh, this says, that uh, any complex differentiable map, when I think of it as a mapping from the plane to the plane, is what's called conformal.
it takes any two curves that meet at a certain angle alpha it's going to take those curves to, to two different curves and I don't think I got it very <laughs> that wasn't very good that's about 90 degrees okay Psh. okay and that angle the angle and the outputs have to have to be the same so here's the inputs and here's the outputs through this function this mapping F it has to preserve angles okay F preserves angles now if I'm going at speed 1 here that does not mean I have to be speed 1 here it can scale that okay but it has to be the same scaling here if I go along this at speed 1 and this scales to like speed 3 maybe that's got to scale to speed 3 okay so all it does is rotate and uniformly scale and that's very special it can't scale these guys differently it can't uh, mess with the angles so 45 degrees got to go to 45 degree 90 degree because got to go to 90 degree in particular uh, one of the things that I mentioned about some of the examples in the first and second uh, parts of these videos was like um, like Z goes to Z squared we had this phenomenon that the grid lines went to parabolas but one of the funky things about the parabolas was they met orthogonally okay that was not an accident at all I think I alluded to that um, in that part that that's an aspect of this conformal mapping property okay and no matter how complicated this is that's going to be true remember e to the z takes that grid and turns it into kind of a polar coordinate grid although the circles are going exponentially and that's not the same as this grid by any means. Interesting things are happening, just like this is not the same. Straight lines go into curves, but whenever those curves meet, they are orthogonal because these guys were orthogonal. Okay, um, that's a good, good place to stop for this part.